Okay, I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Wait a second. Uh, the, these just came out um, recently. Uh, the one from about Korea um, was from last month, and the one about Japan just came out today. These are both CNN um, news reports. Uh, we talk a lot about East Asia uh, in here uh, because the uh, author of your textbook, he's Canadian for one thing, but he... Um, his wife is is from Japan, and because of that, he compares East Asia a lot with the United States and with the Western culture, and with uh, uh, the uh, uh, with Canada. Um, but there's things about Japan that you need to know. One of the things you, that you need to know is that uh, Japan is having problems uh, with reproduction. Uh, the reason they're having problems with reproduction is because people aren't getting married. Uh, not only that, they're not just not getting married, they're also not having sex. <laughs> they're not having sex. Um, how do we know that? We know they're not having sex because 25% uh, of all Japanese uh, people over 40 are still virgin. In other words, they've never had sex. Um, you know, this is a statistic most people go, so what? What's, what's the big deal? The United States, uh, it's probably, it's a lot lower than that. It's, uh, uh, it's less than 5%. So what's going on with Japan and why, why are they having all of these problems? Uh, and the problem, of course, they're having is they're not, uh, they're not reproducing themselves. Uh, in order for a society to maintain itself, uh, you need to have at least uh, two. Ch each couple needs to have at least two children, and that that way they reproduce themselves. Uh, but of course, sometimes children don't survive. Uh, so it's a little higher than that. It needs to be like 2.1 uh, to 2.4. Uh, now that we've defeated uh, most of the childhood d diseases, uh, it's not as bad as it used to be. Like when I was born. Uh, but when I was born, uh, back in the, the 40s, right after World War II, one of the things that was happening uh, was that uh, we, were, we had lots, the families were larger. The families uh, decreased during the Depression, and then right after World War II, uh, the economy really uh, uh, expanded, and uh, people started having more children. Uh, I come from a family of six. Um, if you looked at uh, the uh, the people in my my class, uh, my my uh, cohorts, uh, the, most most of them came from families of at least three, uh, and I, I don't really know what the average uh, family size at that time was, but it's, it was. Uh, fairly large. I came from a family of six, which was even considered large at that time. Most families were three, four, or five children, uh, but we had six in my family. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to show you uh, these uh, uh, videos. Uh, these are from CNN, and, and it may uh, mess things up. But let's go ahead, and I'll go ahead and try and see how this works. Let's go ahead and, and uh, talk about uh, Korea first. Let's go ahead and talk about Korea. Um, oops. Okay. Lee Se-yun empties a box of toys onto the living room floor for her boys, hoping to catch a few moments for herself. She used to work in a brokerage firm before launching her own startup. She's not worked in seven years and feels South Korean society no longer appreciates her. We need to recognize that parenting is a new career, she says. The current social climate is that parenting is the beginning of a career break. Lee says her husband wants to help more, but the business culture here means the job does not end when the office closes. A patriarchal society that is slow to evolve still largely sees the mother staying home to care for the children and the father going out to work contributing to the lowest birth rate of any country in the world. President Yun Sok Yeol visited a nursery recently, pledging new parental benefits and the creation of a new committee to come up with fresh ideas. At a baby fair outside Seoul, we met expectant parents who were less than enthused. 
Kim Min Jong is expecting her second child in November. She hasn't worked since her first child, as she says help or good childcare is too expensive. There is no change in how much money we're getting. They've changed the names and merch allowances. But for parents like us, there are no more benefits. Having a baby is very much expected for married couples in South Korea. And single mothers are treated differently. We still have a very kind of puritanical approach to single mothers. Uh, it's as if they have done something wrong by becoming pregnant out of wedlock. Add to that the astronomical cost of housing, here in Seoul in particular, the cost of education and growing economic concern among the youth, and you have the perfect storm. What it means for South Korea and its aging population is a looming shortage of workers to pay into the pension system. There's also a growing number of women who have no interest in getting married or having babies for personal or societal reasons. Uh, Lee Jin Song has written books about wanting to live alone. In Korea, there is a joke like an urban legend. If you're not dating by the time you're 25, you'll turn into a crane, meaning if you're single, you become non-human. Korean women have come to realize that marriage imposes too much work on them. Marriage, childbirth and childcare require too much sacrifice on women. Lee says it's an issue the government does not understand, a problem that will not get better simply by throwing money at it. Paula Hancock's CNN Seoul. There we go. Let's let's see what Japan. Oh, here this is the one I wanted to show you anyway. Okay. Just after sunrise in the Japanese countryside. No alarm clock needed. The Yokobori family feeds their flock of chickens, feeding themselves freshly laid eggs. French toast for breakfast, bread baked on a wood-burning stove. Wood they chopped from cedar forests surrounding their home. Ten years ago, Miho was an office worker in Tokyo. Today, she's a homemaker. Former graphic designer Hirohito, now a woodworker. The couple runs a small bed and breakfast. For them, city life lost its luster in 2011. Japan's massive earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown paralyzed Tokyo. Everyone was panicking, so it was like a war, although I've never <gasps> experienced war. Did something change fundamentally for you after that after that disaster? After that? Oh, I have to live the life. A new life in the mountains of Nara Prefecture, their home miles from the nearest train station. Around here, you need a car to get around. It's so beautiful but you're so far away from all of the 24-7 convenience of Japanese city life. They moved to Kawakami Village, a tiny township tucked away on windy roads, the trees taller than most buildings. When the young couple got to know their neighbors, they got quite a shock. Did you guys know before moving out here that the average age was as old as it is? <laughs> no. You didn't know. <laughs> The mayor tells me more than half the village is over 65. 40 years ago, the population was around 6,000. Today, it's 1,156. The village population plunging faster than anywhere else in Japan. Some say it's in danger of disappearing for good. As people pass away, abandoned homes sit empty. Others sit underwater. Casualties of a dam and reservoir finished a decade ago. When you see the prediction of, you know, under 300 people living here 20 years from now, how do you, what do you do as mayor to try to stop that from happening? I'm not optimistic, but I don't think it will be that bad. I believe that people should live in such a nice place. The population data is dire, and not just in Kawakami Village. Nearly every local government in Japan predicts a lower population and higher average age by 2045. Entire villages on the verge of extinction. Japanese society is shrinking and aging so fast its future survival is at stake. I'm going to one of the few places in Japan with population growth. You can probably guess where it is. For decades, Japanese young people have been 
fleeing their small rural towns, lured by the draw of big cities like Tokyo and Osaka, all of them connected by the bullet train. But there's no magic bullet for Japan's population problems. Even in Tokyo, the towers are high, birth rates hit record lows. Japan's population plummeting for more than five years. If the trend continues, experts fear it will fall past the point of no return with too few women of childbearing age. Why are so few women in Japan having children? People usually... Uh For now, don't have the money. Many don't have time either, says this Tokyo gynecologist. Is life here in Tokyo too busy for a lot of people to find a partner? Working in the not office and at home, so very difficult to meet other people. It sounds like there's a lot of lonely people in this big, massive city. <laughs> yeah, it's so I think so too. Things are so bad, Tokyo's government is starting to subsidize egg freezing, hoping working women today become working moms tomorrow. New parents in Japan already get a baby bonus, thousands of dollars to cover medical costs. For singles, a state-sponsored dating service powered by artificial intelligence. So far, boosting Japan's birth rate has been a losing battle. The Yokoboris are doing their part. So when he was born, he was the first child in this village in how many years? 25 years. 25 years. Their neighbor, a lifelong villager, says Kentaro's birth boosted everyone's spirits. Hello. Kentaro. He calls me grandpa. My grandson lives in Kyoto, and I don't get to see him much. It sounds like Kentaro has a lot of adopted grandparents here. So okay, man. I think so. I really think it's a big deal. Also a big challenge, raising a child in the mountains, no neighborhood kids to play with, just six children in his kindergarten class, 30 minutes away. The nearest high school, more than two hours away. We'll do the best we can, but the rest is up to Kentaro. Both say it's okay if their son decides to leave someday. Population data does show more young people moving to the countryside, lured by the low cost of living, clean air, and low stress lifestyle. The key question, is Japan doing enough to pull up its plunging population before it's too late? Will Ripley, CNN, Nara Prefecture, Japan. Okay, interesting, two interesting stories. Um... And that is what we're talking about when we're talking about East Asia. Uh, China was China's uh, population was exploding in the in the uh, right after World War II, uh, uh, just exploding. And, and of course, they have the largest population in the world. Uh, but they were limiting their uh, their citizenry to only one having one child. Uh, that's how they they tried to uh, control it. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure where they are, but we can see where Japan and Korea are. Uh, Korea has the lowest birth rate in the world, and Japan is, is having problems uh, reproducing uh, their population uh, as it is. This is something that we, have, we need to remember when we're talking about uh, East Asia and, uh, and uh, the Western world. Um, it's, it's, it's the reality of today. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and get into the rest of the lecture. When stimuli are grouped according to the perceived similarity of their attributes, it is called the taxonomic categorization strategy. Taxonomic categorization answers uh, are especially common among Westerners. Uh, so if we were going to categorize this, would we categorize, would we select, uh, wait a second, let me get my arrow back. Would we select uh, the two uh, furry animals, or would we put the carrot with the uh, with the rabbit? Uh, dogs, of course, don't eat carrots, not normally anyway. Thematic character, character, uh, categorization strategy is where stimuli are grouped together on the basis of ca causal temporal 
or special relationships. Thematic categorization is especially common in East Asia. So they, their way of looking at things is a little bit different than, uh, than the way Western man looks at things. This difference in categorization strategy reflects an underlying difference in the ways that people attend to their worlds. Analytic thinking is characterized by a focus on objects and their attributes. Objects are perceived as existing independently from their contexts. They are understood in terms of their component parts. Context is very important. The attributes that make up objects are used as a basis for categorizing them, and a set of fixed abstract rules is used to predict and explain the behavior of these objects. Analytic thinking is more common in Western countries than in China, Japan, and Korea. Holistic thinking is characterized by an orientation to the context as a whole. It represents an associative way of thinking, which gives attention to the relations among objects and the surrounding context. In holistic thinking, objects are understood in terms of how they relate to the rest of the context and their behavior is predicted and explained on the basis of those relationships. Holistic thinking also emphasizes knowledge gained through experience rather than the application of fixed abstract rules. Holistic thinking is more common in East Asia. Analytic thinkers tend to show field independence. They can separate objects from their background fields. Holistic thinkers tend to show field dependence. They tend to view objects as bound to their backgrounds. And if we look at this picture, it looks like this lady has no torso, but the reality is, of course, she's holding a mirror. Um, and this is a picture of, uh, if we can determine what that is, it's actually a picture of Michael Jackson. East Asians have been socialized from such a young age to attend to relationships that they do so unconsciously scanning scenes. Westerners have been socialized to attend to focal objects, and they thus habitually tend to direct their attention at such objects. Looking at the art of East Asia, we can see that the art is very different from Western art. East Asian art is painted with a higher horizon, creating more context in the picture. In their portraits, the background is much more complex, and the figures in the paintings are smaller than in Western art. And these are pictures from China, and these are pictures from Japan. Uh, so it's got a, a deeper horizon, a higher horizon, so that we see so much more. Uh, the pictures in, in China, of course, very complex. Uh, person, this is a portrait of the person in the middle uh, in, in the picture. Uh, this is a picture of these three uh, women, uh, as we can see, Japan and you know, art from Japan and, and, and China. From the Louvre, of course, this, these are Western pictures. Uh, the, the individual is, is the largest part, and that is the focus, is the individual's more so than what is around them. Hello. Ma Masuda and Gonzalez and colleagues in 2008 had American and East Asian students draw landscapes with a person, river, tree, house, and a horizon. They were seeking to see the differences between the two groups. And this is actually a Western picture. These are Western pictures. East Asians drew a horizon that was significantly higher in the picture than was it was for the Americans. East Asians tended to provide a more complex background in their drawings. East Asians included 75% more contextual objects than, both, than did the Americans. East Asians were more likely than Americans to situate their objects in context. It, so the context was far more important than the individual. When East Asians take photographs of others, they tend to include more background. They also tend to have smaller figures in their portraits compared to Americans. And th this is actually a picture <laughs> taken by Americans dressed like Japanese. And these are picture from, pictures from Asia. 
Uh, I think they're Japanese, as you can see. Uh, the individual is important, but there's a lot more context. There's a lot more background. And there you go. <clears throat> Once again, the child is the most important thing, and she's eating an ice cream cone, but we can see everything in the background. And this is an American picture. The uh, background is not even in focus. And two more American pictures, and once again, the background is not really in focus in either of these pictures. It's the children in the pictures that are the most important part. And more Americans. So here we've got all these things on the wall, but they're not really important. They're standing in front of their garage door. Not really important. It is the individual. When Masada and Gonzalez and colleagues in 2008 looked at American East Asian Facebook pages, they found that East Asian photos had smaller figures and larger backgrounds compared to American photos. And these are photos from Japan. Photos from Japan. And photos from China. Looking at Japanese photographs of buildings, researchers discovered that these photographs had more boundary structures than American photographs. And this is a picture from Japan. The Japanese drive on the, east, the left side of the road, by the way. Um, I'm not sure where they picked it up. I think they must have picked it up from the British. But uh, if you noticed uh, when he was uh, riding in that car, the, the steering wheel was on the right. <laughs> Uh, I lived in Japan for about six months. Uh, that was interesting, driving on the left side of the road. And the cars are a lot smaller. Physical landscapes from Japan are literally busier than landscapes in the United States. And these are two Japanese pictures. And there's pictures of downtown. Lots of wires in Japan. We lived in Masawa. Oh, wires everywhere. <clears throat> and here are pictures from the United States, of course. This is a church. This is the Capitol building. And there's a building, another church, or school building. I guess that's a school building. And there's the Chrysler building in New York. Since cities in East Asia tend to be more crowded than Western cities, living in the busier physical environment fosters the ability to attend to a lot more information at once. When they looked at how scientists from East Asia pre present their findings on posters, they had busier posters with more words than North American participants. This is an American poster, and that does look fairly busy, but look at a, an Asian poster. I'm sorry, it's a Chinese poster. And see how busy that one is. Researchers looked at the government and university websites in East Asia and North America. The Asian websites were much longer than the North American websites and had sig significantly more links and words. The East Asian websites were busier with more information for people to navigate. And this is a, obviously an East Asian uh, website, and I didn't show you one from the United States. Researchers discovered that Westerners were more likely to explain people's behaviors in terms of their underlying dispositions, while East Asians and possibly people from other cultures were more likely to explain people's behaviors in terms of contextual variables. <clears throat> when people from India and the United States were asked to describe a person, the Americans were more likely to describe the people in abstract personality traits, and Indians described people in concrete behaviors they observed. She is friendly. She brings cakes to my family on festival days. That would be from India. Researchers analyzing news stories of murders in the United States, China, and Japan discovered that the East Asian papers described the murders in situational terms. The murderer had a rivalry with another student. They had been recently fired. The American reports tried to interpret the situation from a dispositional point of view. The murderer had a very bad temper. The shooter was described as mentally unstable. 
Personality information is not seen as equally important for explaining the behavior of others in all cultural contexts. Westerners tend to use personality information more for understanding others and themselves than East Asians do. People from many other non-Western cultures show a pattern of focusing on, situ on situation rather than disposition similar to East Asians. Religious groups differ in their attributions as well. American Protestants are more likely than American Catholics to make dispositional attributions. This difference between sects appears to be a function of Protestants having a greater commitment to the idea that people have individual souls rather than it's a, it's a group endeavor, it's an individual endeavor. So if you have a church full of people uh, and, it, and it's a Protestant church, then the idea is that the individual will be able, uh, will uh, determine whether they are able to go to heaven or not. If it's a, uh, if it's a more um, holistic uh, a group, uh, it's the group that goes to heaven, not, not the individual. If people believe that people are judging them on the basis of what their soul has done, it follows that they are more likely to view the soul as being the cause of the individual's behaviors. People's socioeconomic status predicts the kinds of attributions that people make. Working class Americans make more situational attributions and fewer dispositional attributions than middle class Americans. The same kinds of class differences in explaining other people's behaviors have also been found in France and also Russia, and also India. If analytic thinkers tend to, to view the world as operating to a set of universal abstract rules and laws, they will apply these rules and laws when trying to make sense of a situation. This is termed rule-based reasoning. Holistic thinkers should be more likely to make sense of a situation by considering the relationships among objects and events. They should look for evidence of events clustering together, such as similarity among events or of temporal con contiguity of events. This is termed associative reasoning. Westerners appear to view change as occurring in linear ways. Change appears in static and predictable ways. Stocks rise after an election. Stocks will rise in 2020 or 2024. East Asians believe that change happens in fluid and unpredictable ways, but Westerners are looking for patterns. East Asians aren't. This is a Chinese story of, of unpredictability. <clears throat> this is kind of interesting because uh, I teach this every, every year, <laughs> this story every year. And when I was at my uh, class reunion, uh, somebody started telling me this story. And, of course, I uh, already knew this story. One day, an old farmer's horse ran away from him. His neighbors came by to comfort him, but he said, How can you know it isn't a good thing? A few days later, his horse came back, bringing a wild horse with it. His neighbors came to con congratulate the old man, who said, How can you know it isn't a bad thing? A few weeks later, the old farmer's son was trying to ride the wild horse and fell off, breaking his leg. When the neighbors came over to express condolences, the old man said, How can you know it isn't a good thing? The next month, a war broke out, and all the able-bodied young men were recruited to fight in it. The old farmer's son did not have to go because of his broken leg, and he survived with his father. East Asians have been known, uh, shown to place uh, more value on things that have happened in the past compared with the future. The opposite is found in North Americans. Uh, attitudes toward the future vary across cultures, and East Asians have quite different expectations and predictions about the future compared with Westerners. And this is one of the things that we need to understand if we're dealing with with a, an enemy that is East Asian. Uh, and of course, this happened during World War II. Uh, the Chinese were our allies and the Japanese were our enemies. Uh, now it's kind of the other way around. The Japanese are our allies and the Chinese are potentially our enemies. 
So we need to understand that uh, the way that we look at the future isn't the same way that they look at the future. Creativity is a generation of ideas that are novel, useful, and appropriate. Westerners prefer novel objects more than East Asians. They generate a larger number of ideas when they are primed with individualistic thoughts than collectivistic ones. And Asian Americans show more divergent thinking when primed with American culture compared with Asian culture. The novelty part of the equation appears to be facilitated by individualism and Western cultural experiences. Good creative ideas involve novel solutions that are appropriate for the problem at hand. Collectivism appears to be associated with the generation of useful rather than novel ideas. In collective contexts, people are socialized to be concerned about the opinions of others and to find solutions that will fit with the goals of the members of the group. When Singaporeans were assigned to work together, researchers discovered that they were more likely to com comment on appropriateness of their ideas than when they worked by themselves. Their ideas became less original in groups. And of course, Singapore is uh, on the southern tip of, of Malaysia, which is in East Asia. They are East Asians. When the same research was done in Israel, they found that the Israelis were not affected by the presence of others in the same way. When the same research was done in the Netherlands, they found that the Dutch were not affected by the presence of others in the same way. When the same research was done in Korea, they found that the Koreans reacted more similarly to the Singaporeans than the Israelis and the Dutch. Uh, in other words, the Koreans and the Singaporeans, it was far more important to be uh, for the group to agree than it was uh, for them to come up with novel ideas. For the Israelis and the Dutch, it was more, it was the important thing was the novel ideas, not group agreement. More collectivistic East Asian cultures, with their emphasis on useful ideas, are more likely to foster incremental innovations, whereas more individualistic Western cultures, with their emphasis on novel ideas, encourage more breakthrough ideas, like an airplane, a car airplane. I'm not sure how that works. Japan is the world leader in terms of the number of patents it receives each year. Most of their patents represent incremental improvements, particularly in telecommunications, information technology, and electronics. These are two examples of how you sleep on a subway. These are patented ideas in, in Japan. As you can see, she has a, well, I don't know about sleeping standing up like that. I would think that your knees and hips would buckle, but this is how you do it if you're, you can sleep on the subway. Just attach your, <laughs> your head head to the window. <laughs> uh, talking and language have held a privileged position in much of Western intellectual history. Among the ancient Greeks, Homer concluded that there was no greater skill than to be a good debater, and Socrates thought that knowledge existed within people and could be revealed only through verbal reasoning. In Judeo-Christian beliefs, the word was viewed as sacred because of the divine power to create. In the United States, the freedom to speak one's mind is a birthright protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And that has to do with free speech. Speaking is valued in the West because it is viewed as an act of self-expression and as, as an inextricably bound to thought. Hopefully. Hopefully you're thinking and not talking. Or when you talk, you're thinking before you talk. In East Asian, uh, East Asian cultural traditions, there has been less emphasis on talking, if not outright suspicion of the spoken word. This is a Laotian proverb. Listen with one ear, be suspicious with the other. In other words, don't talk, just listen, and don't trust what you hear. Lao Tzu wrote, uh, He who knows does not speak, he who speaks does not know. Practitioners of many Eastern religions pursue truth through silent meditation, 
rather than through sp spoken prayer. A Korean proverb states, an empty cart makes more noise. Eastern cultural traditions have not cultivated a belief that thought and speech are closely related. Japanese mothers have been shown to speak less to their children than American mothers. Chinese infants as young as seven months have been shown to vocalize less in response to laboratory events than European American infants. Much of what we communicate is excuse me, much of what is communicated in the course of a conversation goes beyond the actual words that are used and is expressed in nonverbal gestures, facial expressions, and voice tone. People seem to be uh, easier to upset in an email than when they are face to face with them. They can't see their smile and wink. People often resort to adding e emoticons or abbreviations to their email or text messages to add the nonverbal contextual cues that are lacking in the emails or text messages. Nonverbal verbal communication is important in all cultures, but there are some rather pronounced cultural differences in the degree to which communication relies on explicit verbal information versus more implicit nonverbal cues. In high context cultures, people are deeply involved with each other, and this involvement leads them to have much shared information that guides their behavior. Much of what is to be communicated can be inferred because people have a great deal of information in common that they can rely on. Thus, they can be less explicit in what they say. East Asians are good examples of high-context cultures. Western and English-speaking countries are generally good examples of low-context cultures. What is conveyed in verbal communication in East Asian cultures is less explicit than what is communicated in English. The words that are said in Japan are often less important than the way that they are said. A pause and a strained look on the face of a Japanese speaker communicates that the information they have is dissatisfying no matter what words they use. The key information is conveyed non-verbally, with the content of the words sometimes being rather empty. And of course, this is one of the reasons why the Japanese were able to, uh, to, to uh, bomb Pearl Harbor, and uh, we were pretty much unaware of what was going on. As far as they were concerned, it was fairly obvious. They'd been telling us for a number of years that they were really upset, and that they thought uh, that, that they considered... Uh, the fact that we cut off their uh, scrap metal supplies and their oil, especially their oil, um, we they they considered that an act of war, and they'd been saying this for a number of, of years, uh, and we were ignoring them because they at the, the same time they were telling us that they weren't going to do anything about it. Well, they'd been calling it an act of war. If we had been Japanese, if we had been East Asian we would have known that the Japanese were going to do something about it. And, but of course, as, uh, as Westerners, uh, we ignored it uh, because you do what you say, not what you act. And of course, it led to the, bo the, uh, the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor, which started World War II for the United States. Since so much is conveyed through nonverbal communication by the Japanese, they tend to have far more trouble leaving messages on answering machines. They're more selective of their wording because they are visualizing how the person on the other end is receiving their messages. And, of course, that is one of the interesting things about the Japanese culture. So we learned a lot about the Japanese and Korean cultures today. And it may not be, you may be thinking, well, you know, the Koreans are just like we are, or the Japanese are just like we are. But the reality is, of course, their culture is very, very much different. Um, and uh, uh, their mores are different as well. And that is the end of chapter, chapter 9. So I'll talk to you next week. I think I will anyway. Let's get